This is a day that our God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It is a joy whenever and however we can come to this time of worship together, and so welcome to this sacred time with One United Church of Christ. The bulletin that accompanies this service can be found on the podcast section of our website at oneucc.org, or it was sent out via the weekly church email on Thursday, which is shared to Facebook. We invite you to find that bulletin, read through the service, read through the folks on the prayer list, and hold them in your prayers throughout the week, and check out the announcements in the bulletin. Highlighting a couple of those, today, October 18th, is the last day to pre-order food for our soup and barbecue sale on November 7th. If you don't pre-order, there still will be food available, we're just not sure what. So if you'd like to guarantee what kind of soup or barbecue you'd like, please send in that order today. Also, we have started a little food pantry outside. If you or somebody you know could benefit from having your food budget stretched by whatever's in that pantry, feel free to stop by, whether it's one meal, a couple meals. If you know somebody who could benefit from this ministry, please share that it is there for them and take what you need. Also highlighting another announcement that our all-congregational budget meeting is November 15th, following outdoor worship, weather permitting. A copy of the budget was sent out in the weekly church email this past Thursday and shared to Facebook if you'd like to look at it before the meeting. The hearts everywhere are in remembrance of the 8,400 plus people in Pennsylvania who have died from COVID-19. We keep them in our prayers, all they have left behind, everyone who loves them, and we also are remembering to do the things that we need to do to keep one another safe. Our case count keeps going up here in Berks County, so friends, please keep washing hands, wearing masks, refraining from gathering as much as possible. Show love for God and for neighbor by doing the things that help keep us all safe. And keep praying, of course. Finally, we always end with a word of thanks. Even though it's frequent, it is no less true. Thank you for all the support that you give our ministry. Thank you for your financial contributions. Most of all, thank you for being Jesus' people in this time and in this place. And so, my friends in Christ, we take a breath and we center ourselves more closely on God as we move more deeply into a time of worship and a time of prayer. May we pray together. In your name, Jesus, we are here to witness to your power, your grace, and your love. You still change lives today as you did long ago. We are so bold to pray that through our worship, you would change us. May we better embrace the callings you give us and serve you and all people with joy. Amen. Part of following Jesus means letting go, letting go of that which keeps us from embracing the life God desires us to have. Every week in worship, we have this prayer of confession. It's really a prayer of letting go. In this moment, we let go of our brokenness, our shame, our mistakes, our soul-killing patterns of thinking and living. We make room for the God of joy to fill our lives. And so in hope and in courage, may we pray. Compassionate God, while we break your heart a million ways, you choose to respond to us with joy and grace. In those moments we turn from our selfishness, you celebrate. When we blunder our way back to you, you welcome us home with open arms. We who have been recipients of far more grace than we know struggle to share that same grace with those around us. Rather than celebrating a change of heart, we're skeptical. Instead of welcoming the weary home, we keep closed doors closed. We wouldn't dream of throwing a party under problematic circumstances. God, we confess our failings of grace and joy. 
Forgive us when we hold too tightly to hurt and nurse our grudges too tenderly. When we stand firmly outside the celebration, your generous love demands, find us, we pray. We crave grace more than we can express and are longing for it to change us more than we let on. Amen. In God's love, we are found, we are claimed, and we are redeemed. People of God, trust that God's grace searches us out and finds us. We are given what we need to start again. For this we say thanks be to God. Amen. Once again, will you join me in prayer? Open to us your words, Holy One. Help us to hear and to be challenged. Help us to listen and be comforted. Help us to turn again to you, and in turning, find joy. Amen. When someone brings you a container of cookies, what is the proper response? Beyond a thank you, many of us believe receiving a container of cookies becomes an obligation. Perhaps we were raised with the rule that you never return a container to someone empty, and so we bake a reciprocal batch of snickerdoodles. What if, though, the giving of the cookies was an act of sheer joy, with the giver expecting nothing in return but the recipient's delight? When an act of joy is met with a requirement of obligation, does the obligation diminish the joy? I think a lot of us can relate to this baking example because we are people who struggle with joy. When someone does something joyful for the sake of joy, we have trouble accepting it as a gift of joyful grace. We also have trouble feeling joy because we live with the sense that we don't want to be too happy because if we give in to joy, something bad might happen and ruin it. Deep down, we believe it's better not to feel joy than to feel joy and have it be ruined. In some respects, we're people perpetually waiting for the other shoe to drop, and it's hard to feel joy when we're always staring at our feet. Yet, joy is one of the best parts of life. Real joy isn't rational, logical, or predictable. Joy sometimes finds us out of the blue, but more often than not, we have to choose to make room for joy. We have to choose to let it seep into our bones and souls. This week in our leadership series, we find another unusual quality of being a leader, joy. While leaders are people who get things done, enact change, guide organizations, good leaders are those who stop to celebrate the moments of joy along the way. Even in the midst of hard work and not yet ideal circumstances, Leaders need to create moments of joy to sustain them and those around them. Without such moments, our work becomes ineffective drudgery and we burn out too quickly. As serious, intentional, and driven as Jesus' ministry is, he grabbed a hold of joy every chance he could. If you read through the Gospels, notice how many times Jesus stops to share a meal with someone and how many times he's criticized for doing so, How many times it seems like he pauses just to enjoy the goodness of life and point it out to others, and how frequently he praises those who embody joy, like Mary, who anointed his feet a couple weeks back. Jesus is all about joy. Unsurprisingly, he incorporates joy into his teachings, like the parable of the prodigal son we'll hear now. 
As we listen to this parable, listen for the ways in which joy shows up among the characters and in the story, and also listen for the word of God as we hear Jesus' words in Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. Jesus said, A certain man had two sons. The younger son said to his father, Father, give me my share of the inheritance. Then the father divided his estate between them. Soon afterward, the younger son gathered everything together and took a trip to a land far away. There, he wasted his wealth through extravagant living. When he had used up his resources, a severe food shortage arose in that country, and he began to be in need. He hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. He longed to eat his fill from what the pigs ate, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have more than enough food, but I'm starving to death? I will get up and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Take me on as one of your hired hands. So he got up and went to his father. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was moved with compassion. His father ran to him, hugged him, and kissed him. Then the son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Fetch the fatted calf and slaughter it. We must celebrate with feasting because the son of mine was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. Coming in from the field, he approached the house and heard music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked what was going on. The servant replied, Your brother has arrived, and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he received his son back safe and sound. Then the older son was furious and didn't want to enter in. But his father came out and begged him. He answered his father, Look, I've served you all these years, and I never disobeyed your instruction. Yet you've never given me as much as a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours returned, after gobbling up your estate on prostitutes, you slaughtered the fatted calf for him. Then his father said, Son, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. This is the word of God, the joyful word for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
If someone we loved insulted us, pretty much wished us dead, turned their back on us, and then years later, after they lost everything, came slinking back, how would we react? Would we run up to them, throw our arms around them in delight, give them a kiss, and make them the guest of honor at the best party we could possibly throw? Likely not. Yet this is what happened in the parable of the prodigal son, the scripture reading we just heard. The father was wished dead by his youngest child, and then who, after wasted everything and hitting rock bottom, comes slinking back home. The wayward one is received joyfully by his father and coldly by his elder brother. While this is a parable of grace, the parable is also disturbing. In the end, nothing is resolved, really. We don't know if the younger son is sincere in his repentance or if he's opportunistic. We don't know if he'll be received back into the household or how much future awaits him there. The parable ends with the older son standing outside the party, furious and hurt, and we don't know if he'll ever join the celebration. All we do know is the lost child has returned home and dad's thrown a party. This is a parable of joy, believe it or not. While there's a lot of unresolved tension, 
We need to focus on the fact that the father chose to throw a party to welcome his wayward child home. Despite past insults, despite the younger son's actions, despite all of the hurt, the father chooses joy, chooses to make his son's homecoming a moment of joy. He could have responded to his son's return by disowning his younger child. He could have slammed the door in his face. The father could have verbally given his youngest the berating he deserved. Yet the father does none of these things. He throws a party, not counting and waiting for the moment until the other shoe drops. He chooses joy even in the midst of unresolved problems, past hurts, and lingering questions. And the eldest son does not choose joy. We know the parable ends with him standing resolutely outside of the party, refusing to share in his father's merriment. We might be on his side, thinking the father is bonkers for throwing a party for a good-for-nothing. We might identify with the older son a little more than we would like. Yet I wonder if the parable is really a commentary on the oldest son's behavior and not the youngest. I've read this story a thousand times, and only this week did verse 31 jump out at me. The elder brother has been complaining to his father about the party that never once did his father give his responsible eldest so much as a young goat to enjoy with his friends. And what does the father say? He reminds his firstborn that everything I have is yours. Everything I have is yours. Does that mean all the young goats and all the fatted calves were there all along waiting for the older son's asking? Maybe he could have thrown a party at any point in time. It's an intriguing idea. Maybe the elder brother should have thrown a party to celebrate his friend's companionship. Maybe he should have had a party to welcome the new moon or the harvest or something. Maybe he should have thrown a party for the sheer joy of being alive. Perhaps then this problematic celebration of the younger son's return is a little less problematic. Perhaps the father seizes every opportunity for joy that comes his way, So then, if the older son never stops and takes time for celebration and joy, whose issue is that? Maybe the elder brother is really the one we should be worried about, that he lives with too little generosity, too little gratitude, too little joy. Joy is a choice, and it requires intentionality. In the parable, the father chose joy. The elder brother apparently didn't know what joy was. Through the parable, Jesus calls us to choose joy. If we're forever waiting for joy to find us or someone to give us some joy, we'll be skulking outside the party forever. We have to choose to come in, to join the celebration, even when the party is set against problematic circumstances. Jesus knew how difficult, yet essential, choosing joy is. Time and again, Jesus chose to be joyful in the midst of his serious, frustrating, and overwhelming work. Even on the last night of his life, Jesus chose to celebrate a moment of joy by sharing a meal with his followers and giving them a way to celebrate his love forever. Like the father in the parable, Jesus chose joy every chance he could, and he calls us to do the same. We need to be intentional about choosing joy, especially right now. To do this, though, we need to look at our shoes a little bit less and stop worrying about what we'll do if one drops. If it does, the moment will be an opportunity to turn to God, to deepen our trust in God working through us and around us to pull us through. In the midst of a global pandemic, even when we're staring down the fall wave, choosing to celebrate what we can, even if the circumstances are problematic, is a way to be intentional about joy. Being intentional about joy is also one of the best coping mechanisms we have to pull us through this season. 
If we're forever focusing on everything we've lost, how scary the world is, how stupid and hypocritical people are being, we will burn out. Choosing joy doesn't mean we take unnecessary risks or deny the serious state of the world. Holding on to the moments of joy doesn't mean we hold other moments less carefully. Seizing joy means we choose to care for our hearts and souls so we can keep caring for those around us. Seizing joy is a choice to join in God's prodigal ways. Friends, how can you be intentional about joy this week? What can you celebrate? Maybe you don't have a big event like a wayward child coming home who you thought was lost and now is found, but maybe you can sit down with a cup of coffee and connect with your dearest, longest-held friend and talk. Maybe you can go for a drive or a hike and bask in the changing fall leaves. Maybe you can make a batch of soup and hold a bowl of it in your hands and feel the warmth and savor the aroma. Maybe you order pizza and have a family game night. Maybe you celebrate Tuesday for no other reason than it's Tuesday and you're alive. When the world is problematic, we can choose to be present to the occasions of joy whenever and however they find us. Or perhaps we decide for ourselves what is joy. The father in the parable chose to celebrate his younger son's return when his younger son's showing up could have been an occasion for pain and misery. Jesus chose joy as often as he could, even on the last night of his life. God calls us to make similar choices, to delight in the moments of joyful grace whenever and however we can. Joy is essential to this God-given life. So if someone brings you a container of cookies, don't worry about baking obligatory snickerdoodles. Delight in the cookies. Have a cup of coffee with them if you like. And then, only if you feel called to it, if this gift has given you joy, bake some cookies and give the container to somebody completely different who could use a little reminder of unbidden, grateful joy. May it be so in your lives and mine, today and in the days ahead. Amen. In our time of prayer this morning, each petition will end with the words, God, in your joy, I invite you to respond, hear our prayer. And so may we be together in God's spirit in this time of prayer. Holy God, we celebrate this day and this time to be with you. In worship, we are given your spirit that strengthens us for all of life's challenges. Thank you for your endless love, that you always welcome us home no matter where we've been and how far we've wandered. God, in your joy, hear our prayer. For all of its brokenness, you have made the world with so much beauty and wonder. Today we praise you, God, for the changing season and for the vibrant, fiery leaves around us. We praise you for the people who love us and care for us. We give thanks for the simple pleasures of life, a mug of warm tea, the matchup of our favorite teams, a sit-down dinner with family, a good book. God, in your joy, hear our prayer. We savor these moments of joy, Holy One, while still knowing pain continues and so much is in need of your healing grace. And so we pray for those close to us, for those who have asked for our prayers. We pray for all we've named on our prayer list, especially for Gail and for Margo. Bring them healing, give them moments of goodness, even in the midst of struggle. God, in your joy, hear our prayer. We also pray for all the hurting spaces of the world, for Armenia and Azerbaijan, for Syria, for countries everywhere battling COVID, for the deep divisions in our own country. As much as we want you, O oh God, to swoop down and fix everything, we know that's not how you operate. 
And so please strengthen us, we pray, to be your agents of reconciliation, healing divisions where we can, supporting the work of those fighting for life and human rights, sharing our time and resources in the ways that you call us to. God, in your joy that reimagines the world, hear our prayer. All of this and all that rests within each of us, we raise to your grace and love as we pray in the words Jesus gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
People of God, we are alive and have gathered in the presence of God and have received far more grace than we know. Our presence here has brought God joy. May you leave this time to bring joy to others, delighting and celebrating in this God-given life. And may the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the power of the Holy Spirit go with you now and always. Amen.